Let's talk about happiness. Now, I'm not going to sit here and try to give you the definitive manifesto about happiness. But what I want to do is connect what we're experiencing today with current events, your life, and the most important thing to remember about happiness, which is that it's a choice, a state of contentment, emotional well-being, goodness in your brain, happiness, right? So we're going to get to the section in freedom today, happiness causes freedom, because a lot of people have wanted me to start reading sections of the book and explaining them. And I thought this is a great way to start. So I'm going to read the first paragraph and then we're going to cover a bunch of news stories and bring in some data and some studies to back up and underscore what I'm saying here. So gather around for a little little story time, children. No, it's not a story. But chapter nine, section four of freedom, happiness causes freedom. And this is the section that I wrote when I was in jail. If we don't know how to be happy, what's the point of being free? What good is it to live in a free society, in a free country or a free world if we are so emotionally crippled that we are incapable of enjoying it? Why would we struggle to escape the oppression of police, parliaments and presidents if only to remain enslaved to fear and insecurity. Many of us would assume freedom should lead to happiness, but that does not correctly describe the relationship. The way most of us understand freedom and happiness is backwards. Happiness is not the result of freedom. Happiness causes freedom. So. To the next story, we go to the Associated Press by Tamara Lush. Poll, Americans are the unhappiest they've been in 50 years. Spoiler alert, 2020 has been rough on the American psyche. Folks in the U.S. are more unhappy today than they've been in nearly 50 years. This bold yet unsurprising conclusion comes from the COVID response tracking study conducted by NORC and ORC at the University of Chicago. It finds that just 14% of American adults say they're very happy, down from 31%. You said the same in 2018. That year, 23% they'd often or sometimes felt isolated in recent weeks, now 50%. Now think about this. 31%, almost a third of the population in just 2018. So they were very happy. I'm very happy. Since I wrote this, at least, and since I realized, since I really incorporated this idea, and I have nothing else from today's show, you're able to incorporate this idea because it will permanently make you happier for the rest of your life. Yes, it is that powerful of an idea of, of being able to choose happiness, to understand it and have a healthy relationship with your own mind and, and, and emotional state. But just for the country, think about this. That third of the population that was very happy, going around every day, very happy, just got cut in half. How many of the very unhappy, clinically depressed, suicidal people were those very happy people holding up, perhaps? The effects of this shut down and forced unemployment crisis and period of isolation are going to have far, far reaching psychological effects as well. The survey conducted in late May draws on nearly a half century of research from the General Social Survey, which has collected data on American attitudes and behaviors at least every other year since 1972. No less than 29% of Americans have ever called themselves very happy in that survey. 
29%. So look at this on the on the chart. Did you pull that up, please, CJ? That that middle line, that dark blue, very happy, has been cruising since 1972 between 30 and 40 percent. Look, uh, high point 1974, 38 percent. Low point, 1972, 30%, hitting that again, 94, 85, and then 2018, 31%, low side of normal. 2020, down to 14%. Now, where do those people go? Now, there are three options on this one. Very happy, pretty happy, or not too happy. Kind of vague there, right? Well, we look at the other two lines of the chart. The majority of Americans, between 50 and 60%, that line, similarly cruising since 1972, 53%. Hitting a low, 1974, 49. A high, 60 in 1985. Now, up to 62%. But you look at the bottom line, the orange line, they're not too happy. 17% was the high in 1972. Certainly not our best economic days. Down to 8% in 1988. Maybe things were looking better. 2018, still staying normal. Cruising around that 10% mark, 13. 2020, shoots up to 23%. That's a significant shift. Sounds like America and really the world that is experiencing similar issues right now could benefit from stopping the talk about the fear and anxiety about coronavirus and racial division and rights and protests and talk about happiness for a few minutes. But before we talk about happiness anymore, we go to studyfinds.org. Global study reveals four in 10 adults living with a gastrointestinal disorder. <laughs> well, Adam, that took a weird turn, didn't it? Bear with me. Gothenburg, Sweden, everyone will eventually deal with an upset stomach at some point in their life. For some, those troubles don't go away fast and can affect their quality of life. A new study has revealed gastrointestinal disorders are more common than you might think. Nearly half of all adults worldwide are living with them. According to the research published in the journal Gastroenterology, four in 10 adults across the globe are dealing with a gastrointestinal disorder. Over 73,000 people in 33 countries were surveyed about their stomach issues. Nearly half of the women questioned were found to have at least one functional gastrointestinal disorder. It's striking how similar these findings are between countries. We can see some variations, but in general, these disorders are equally common, whatever the country or continents. This co-author Magnus Simran from the University of Gothenburg in a statement. Now, here's an interesting feature of this. The stigma. Simran and the researchers in Sweden add that patients responding to web-based surveys had a much higher rate of FGIDs compared to people taking in-person interviews. So clearly, the internet causes gastrointestinal disorders, and we need to abolish the internet. Now, obviously, there's a different fact here. Causation and correlation do not always equate. We don't know why we're seeing this difference, but one reason might be that people think it's embarrassing to talk about stomach and bowel symptoms to someone sitting in front of them. So 24 countries conducted the survey through the internet, seven used in-person Wide range of discomfort. So this is this is everything from, uh, you know, heartburn, acid reflux, indigestion, irritable bowel syndrome, constipation, bloating, chronic discomfort, things like that. So here's where it might get very interesting, and you're going to see just how we're going to bring these two issues together here. Also from StudyFinds.org. Surprise, surprise. Smile for your stomach. Happiness may guard against deadly gut infections. And you're like, whoa, 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 wait. <laughs> okay, okay, Adam, nice leap back to the main subject here. 
Positivity isn't always easily achieved, but a new study provides yet another reason we should all do our best to inject a bit of optimism into our mindsets. Researchers from the UT Southwestern Medical Center have found evidence that serotonin, the brain chemical responsible for feelings of happiness and well-being, may be able to stop harmful intestinal pathogens from causing deadly infections. Essentially, the study indicates that happiness can protect against serious gut infections. Yes, serotonin is almost always thought of as a brain chemical, but about 90% of it is actually produced in the gastrointestinal tract. There's also trillions of bacteria living in the stomach as well, and while the vast majority of those bacteria are good and beneficial, some pathogenic, pathogenic bacteria also make their way to the gastrointestinal tract when this happens. It can lead to serious and sometimes fatal gut infections. So we know that this is not the most important connection with happiness. So maybe you don't get a little diarrhea because I want to have that's not that's if, if being happy for its own sake wasn't enough. I mean, like, let's say, like, even even if you decide, like, yeah, like, when is it when is it appropriate to not be happy, right? When because this is again when we're gonna come back to this about emotional freedom which is the first section, chapter nine, in, in the book. Um, you know, when it, when it comes to emotional freedom, you as a, as, as a conscious entity, as a, as a human mind that functions, now, the caveat, you know, if your body's not working properly, if your brain, brain chemistry is messed up, you know, maybe you got to address that before your, your capability is, is fully restored to be able to be happy, to choose to be happy. What I mean by that is that, you're going to have emotional reaction that you can't control, right? And happiness can be a, you're going to have a happy response. Like you saw something nice and made you smile. It made you happy. You, happy. you know, you really, the emotional response, really, really it's, it's more pleasure, right? Because you're being given pleasure. Some people screw this up, right? This is kind of how depression works. You can get pleasure and your brain chooses depression instead of choosing happiness, right? The natural response, though, is pleasure and happiness are associated. But you can have negative responses, too, right? You can have pain. Uh, you can have fear, you know, things that make you angry. All of these animalistic emotional responses are an undeniable part of the human condition. So when I talk about emotional freedom and emotional mastery and choosing happiness, I don't mean some like, you know, ideal blissful Buddhist state where like you can have a, you know, a nail driven through your nutsack and go, oh, no, it's OK. I, I smile. No, um, it's not to try to pretend that, that you should achieve some, you know, otherworldly state of you know, meditative bliss, but that you can control your response to the reaction, your conscious response. That's your choice. You cannot choose the animalistic reaction, but you can choose how you consciously choose to configure your mind, your attitude, your outlook. That's your choice. So here's another reason why it's important, skipping ahead to the Daily Mail. Can negative thinking lead to dementia? People with a gloomy outlook could be more likely to get degenerative illness, research suggests. Repetitive negative thoughts, also known as RNT, could lead to Alzheimer's. This way of thinking can lead to a buildup of harmful deposits in the brain. A journalist called for more research into RNT as a potential factor for dementia. And now, I didn't really answer the question that I proposed a second ago, right? Like, when? When is it okay? When when should you choose to not be happy, right? Because yeah, the emotional response time is when you don't have that choice. But when when is it okay to just choose to be unhappy? I think if you're focused on something in order to address, like if you choose, like hey, something's something's really messed up. I'm I'm gonna put aside choosing to be happy in order to choose to be motivated by fear of loss, to be motivated uh, to, to be protective, to be productive, to, to make sure that in the future, I, I can be happy as my default state the majority of the time. So there are times when you go, well, I'm in, I'm in survival mode. And that's okay. But the point of survival mode is to get out of survival mode. And this is built into our biology, right? You've all heard of the fight or flight reflex. Right, that in times of overwhelming fear, you have a a, a a tendency to either fight what you're facing 
or to run away from it, fight or flight. And, and that's fine. But when we allow the mainstream media, the fear mongering of government to keep us in a distressed, distressed state, we, we are giving up our, our, our emotional freedom, our emotional sovereignty to these outside forces. That's the worst kind of, of slavery, to, to allow yourself to be an emotional slave to the people around you because they're going to manipulate you. That's what, that's what people do. And, and through the media, through institutions, through major mass communications and propaganda, that's how they control us. It's a dangerous form of emotional manipulation. All you have to do is make the right choice to choose an attitude of happiness, to choose to make happiness your default position. So a couple more stories here. Also from the Daily Mail. How to live to 100 and enjoy it. Yes, diet and exercise do matter, but scientists are only just realizing friendships can add years to your life, too. Marta Zaraska has been a writer for Washington Post and Scientific American. Scientists say we need to look at the softer social and psychological approaches. A committed romantic relationship can lower your risk of early death by 49%. And yeah, nature, nurture, causation, correlation. Do healthier people get married and live longer? Does marriage make you live longer? Um, yeah, you, not relevant for this conversation. But as it says, but in our obsession with this wellness junkie lifestyle of uh, diets, organic goji berries, cardio workouts, fitness trackers, are we missing the real drivers of long life? As a health writer on the Washington Post and Scientific American, I dig through hundreds of research papers every year and talk to dozens of scientists. And out of this research, a new story is beginning to emerge, suggesting that exercise gadgets and calendars are not as important to health as we used to think. Studies that shatter long-held beliefs are repeated over and over again in academic papers. To encourage longevity, to make it to 100, scientists say that rather than focus solely on diet and exercise, we need to concentrate on softer social and psychological approaches that will benefit us. The number one thing you can do for long life is to have a committed romantic relationship. Second, having a large social network of friends, family, and neighbors, which can reduce the likelihood of early death by 45%. Third, foster a conscientious personality this cuts the risk by 44 percent so conscientious personality that is so important skipping ahead as it says rolling your eyes at him makes you fat in a fascinating 2016 experience experiment couples were asked to discuss a topic they disagreed on for 20 minutes while researchers noticed noted their levels of hostility, including eye-rolling and critical comments. After the marital squabbling session was over, the husbands and wives were served a fatty meal of egg and sausage, totaling almost a 1,000 calories. For the next seven hours, the volunteers remained at the lab while their bodily functions were repeatedly measured. Amazingly, the couples who fought most unpleasantly had lower resting energy expenditure and higher insulin after the greasy meal, meaning their bodies were not dealing well with all that fat. The difference in energy intake from the food between the dirty Fighters and those who were nicer to their spouses was 128 calories. Over a year, that could add up to almost eight pounds of extra weight. Eye rolling really can make you fat. Whoa. Yeah, just that. That's that's a cool study. There's a really cool methodology breakdown. And they're saying, what's they're asking the question, what would what difference in your life uh, or, or really what difference to your body weight would it make if you argued with your spouse for 20 minutes a day? You would gain eight pounds a year. Now, it's it, that's uh, there's one criticism I would have of this study, which is that that extrapolation is not entirely fair to make. But what's re really important about this is that it could be because of the metabolic effects that are negative about this. Now, like, you can argue and stay skinny, like there's like yeah, you can you can overcome this. It's not hey, if you argue, you're going to gain weight. It's that it messes up your metabolism that way. So if you're going to argue and stay skinny, you're going to be fighting this hormonal imbalance that comes from the negativity that, res that, that results from just 20 minutes of verbal conflict. So it's not just, hey, you're going to have to work harder. What are the, what are the negative impacts of this? 
It's your hormones, your stress hormones. You're staying in that fight or flight response. And that's going to have, it's going to create more bad habits. It's going to compound. It's going to have more effects. And you have to break this cycle for yourself, for your own benefit, if you get sucked into this. So one more section of the story, a positivity folio pays dividends, according to William Shakespeare in The Taming of the Shrew. Frame your mind to mirth and merriment, which bars a thousand harms and lengthens life. As if, yeah, we knew this hundreds of years ago. It's and, and, and it is only, you know, modern mainstream media that is leading us away from this basic awareness. And, of course, the modern paradigm of corporatism and governments and all that. Science is now catching up with literature among the 10,000 academic papers that come out each year on the topic of subjective well-being. Many are finding that positivity equals better health and a better shot at becoming a centenarian. A scientist's way of injecting more positivity into your marriage is creating something psychologists call a positivity portfolio. Make a list of things you love about your spouse. Place happy photos of the two of you around the house and listen to your special songs from time to time. Express gratitude when your partner does something nice. Thank them for it. There are proven links between your emotions and your health. And a happy, stress-free relationship can mean a long life. So what could... I mean, there's there's, there's more in this. It's really funny. I, I love this kind of practical advice. Um, part of it is, uh, you know, BFFs uh, before KOFs. That's best friends forever before kind of friends so having having good friends rather than like a broad social network having having deeper friendships and meaningful connections with people have hot chocolate after an argument organize your cupboards having a sense of organization um and so this is the conscientiousness part and i love this if you were to pick just one personality trait to work on in order to increase your chances of living to 100 it would be conscientiousness a penchant for tidying, planning, and preparing. And I love it. It's just like, oh, my life philosophy in black and white. Because this is a big part of, you know, what we're doing here at the Garden of Freedom. And we've got a bit of a mess here. We've got to clean up right now, I should say, uh, from, from not living here for so long. But tidying, planning, and preparing, and being conscientious. And this is about, you know, conscientiousness. Is, is a much deeper theme in your life that is essential for happiness. If you're not conscientious of your mental state, you can't make that choice. It takes it. it has, you have to have a habit of, of meditative activities in your life, of, of, of good sleep hygiene, of, of getting a good night's sleep, of practicing these things. You know, I love the idea of gratitude exercises and, you know, having some way to incorporate that in your own life, whether it's, you know, before you go to bed or before you wake up, you write down, you know, three things that you're grateful for, you know, all of those things are really helpful and just, and they compound in a positive way. The more you build routine and habit and structure in that positivity, that's what you're training your brain for to be happy. So one of the modern threats comes to us from the New York Post, nypost.com. And this is about organizing and being conscientious about the information that comes into your life, your influences. What media are you consuming? Are you watching a lot of, you know, angry newscasters, you know, pounding their fists on the news desks on cable TV every night? Are, are you watching, you know, the, 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 the crazy conspiracy channels that just assume that everybody in the world is evil and there's no hope for humanity? And, and so this is the new term for this. New York Post, are you a doom scrolling junkie the new scary coronavirus habit and it's not new to coronavirus but it is at a new scale uh really by, by a number of factors one is just the overwhelming nature of the bad news since this coronavirus thing kicked off right we used to say even in march when we first started getting going with this just with the you know, just trying to keep up with everything the flow of news it was like drinking from fire hose every time I looked at the Drudge Report, like, holy crap, you know, every day feels like a week and it's all bad. It's stuff you got to keep up with because it's a threat to your life. It's going to affect you. Ever find yourself glued to your phone screen, mindlessly thumbing through depressing news for hours on end? Well, now there's a word for that. 
doom scrolling, the trendy new phrase, which has now joined the ranks of other coronavirus inspired terms like quarantini and zoom bombing is making a quarantine. That's making an alcohol drink with whatever's available while you're in quarantine. Uh, zoom bombing. I think you can figure that out. Bombing a zoom video meeting, right? Is making the rounds on Twitter to describe everyone's incessant need to consume somber story. Things I'm doing a lot more under isolation, cooking, cleaning, taking deep breaths while walking dogs, doom scrolling, sleep meditations, FaceTiming, existential crisis scene, tweeted Ann Allen Peterson, a senior culture writer at BuzzFeed News on March 22nd. I've been reading easy junk just to keep me from doom scrolling lately, and it feels so good to exercise my brain with some substance, admitted another user at Brainy McSoftface. And, you know, this is something I, I kind of grapple with myself, right, because I want to keep up with the news. I want to follow what's going on. And I do kind of limit myself, right? You kind of have to in order to maintain a, a positive, healthy perspective. And I do make an effort in what we're covering with the news with Adam versus the man to make sure that we have segments about happiness every now and then. We, we cover positivity. We cover human progress. We talk about the underreported stories about things getting better every day. So, you know, I wonder if, if, if you're tempted to doom scrolling, would, you know, mindless entertainment be better? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And this is, again, where conscientiousness comes in. If you can direct your brain and your attention to more positivity, to things that enrich your life, to things that, that uh, you know, are, are educational, informative, as well as entertain. If you, if you can't do that, if you don't, and obviously that would be the ideal information diet, but at, at some point you don't have the energy for that. If you need some mindless escape, at least make sure it's, it's humorous and, and positive and friendly, even if it's neutral in terms of its greater value. You're getting positive value out of that. If you go, well, I'm bored. I'm going to doom scroll. I'm gonna just go, and don't follow people like that. You know, control. Be conscientious of what you put in your brain. You know, I, I hear woke people talking, oh, you got to be careful about what you put in your body and no GMOs and process it's like yeah but what about your brain or will you put in your body like what about your brain isn't that more important so back to uh the new york post the apt expression has been picking up steam since it was included in a recent la Times story about new terms entering our pandemic lexicons but some trailblazers have been throwing them throwing around the term ever since lockdown life began last month include, including including Quartz reporter Karen Ho, she's been doling out the moniker and posts to remind people to give themselves a break from the doom and gloom of COVID-19 news. This is awesome. I encourage everybody to do this. So whatever you can, uh, build reminders into your life. And she said, it's okay not to develop a new skill or side project during a pandemic, just like how it's okay to set limits on how much you doom scroll at night. Yes. You cannot be too conscientious about your own mental health and well-being and lifestyle. And, you know, like I said, at the Garden of Freedom and what I've always advocated as a libertarian, like even here in the book, you know, the sections before uh, this are health freedom and work freedom. Like that's, yeah, being conscientious of your lifestyles, really like from the ground up, not being mindless and going with the assumptions of what's been laid out for you before or being a victim of your past trauma and negative thought patterns. You know, a big part of this, too, is just finding whatever therapy that you need personally to retrain your brain. A lot of our negative thought patterns are based on individualized experiences, specific traumas that we've experienced. As, as veterans dealing with PTSD, you know, like I did with Homefront Battle Buddies, uh, our peer support group for Iraq Veterans Against the War, for vets dealing with PTSD, so helpful for, for, for people who have made that choice to say, you know what? My brain's doing something I don't like. I could train it to be better. I could train it to be stronger. I could train it to be more effective. And one of the things is I've got this negative thought pattern because I saw this dude die in combat and I've got this survivor's guilt. I need to talk it out. I need to process this it out. And so this is one of those times it's okay to not be happy. Like be serious. You know, be concerned. Be afraid that that trauma might ruin your happiness for the rest of your life and then address it properly. Nip it in the bud. As soon as you recognize it, you end that negative thought pattern. And you say, you know what? I'm doing this. I'm taking it seriously so I can get back to being happy. Get away from the doom scrolling. 
In another post that same day, Karen added, you can keep doom scrolling tomorrow. Others are following suit as Kelsey Snell with NPR wrote, quote, today I'm grateful for baby naps, exercise, and fresh air. Let's all stop doom scrolling for a bit. Many are actually losing sleep over their doom scrolling habits. I got to admit, this is something I've done, you know, right before bed, I'm on my phone. Oh, well, let me just drop in and check in on Drudge Report one more time. Let me just, let me just talk to a few people on Twitter. But you know what? I, I don't really, I think for a long time, I've kind of gotten away from the habit of doom scrolling just based on how I've trained myself to read the news and look at the world and, and stay in touch with what I know to be true about the broader positive vision of human progress. And by the way, that's in the book too. Chapter 10, The Future of Freedom. You know, one of my favorite sections here is uh, the asymptote. And it talks about the, uh, the paradigm shift and, and the increase of the internet effect and the asymptote taking, you know, humanity to the next level of human experience as, as things are accelerating and, and getting faster and faster, improving. So, you know, I, I don't I don't really catch my sometimes I'll get caught up with a story and I'll, you know, I'll get, you know, more into it than I should. But that's again why I like being organized now and having this show live consistently daily at the same time every day and and being able to build that routine of positivity because it was just well it, one of the things i used to do when the show wasn't live and i wasn't i wasn't committed to the time is that i, I would do a kind of well i have to make sure that journalistically I've, I've gone down every rabbit hole about this story and i would catch myself you know in in, in a certain way doing a kind of uh doom scrolling in my prep i think i've done a, a much better job now of, you know, rearranging my life habits so that I'm not doing that. So, you know, another story about the negative effects of a bad mood, uh, we go to CNET.com, of all places, the tech website, how loneliness could be changing your brain and body. And this is really important because, uh, you know, with, along with that survey of happiness, Americans are very lonely, statistically uh, speaking, at least. People were already lonely before the coronavirus pandemic hit, before COVID-19 stranded folks at home and made getting close to others an unnerving experience. Researchers were realizing Americans were lonelier than ever. A 2018 study from health insurer Cigna found that 54% of 20,000 Americans surveyed reported feeling lonely. In the span of a bit more than a year, the number rose to 61%. Generation Z adults, 18 to 22 years old, are supposedly the loneliest generation, outpacing boomers, Gen Xers, and millennials, despite being more connected than ever. More troubling than the epidemic proportions is that a growing body of research suggests that being lonely for a sustained period of time could be bad for your physical health and mental well-being. The same study from Cigna placed associated health risks on par with Smoking and obesity. In a, a 2018 article in the Lancet Medical Journal, described the situation like this. Imagine a condition that makes a person irritable, depressed, and self-centered and is associated with a 26% increase in the risk of premature mortality. But these are strange times. As a result of COVID-19, keeping distance from others is the safest way to stay healthy. Bullshit. <clears throat> Despite the fact that it could compound feelings of isolation. It's a new reason to consider how loneliness can impact everything from your brain to your heart to your immune system. Now, why we get lonely? Loneliness might conjure images of being apart from friends and family, but the feeling runs much deeper than not having plans on a Friday night or than going stag to a wedding. Evolutionarily, being part of a group has meant protection, sharing the workload and increased odds of survival. After all, humans take a long time and mature. We need our tribes. It's very distressing when we are not part of a group, said Julianne Holt Lundstad, professor of psychology and neuroscience at Brigham Young University. We have to deal with our environment entirely on our own without the help of others, which puts our brain in a state of alert. But that signals, but that also signals the rest of our body to be in a state of alert. Again, fight or flight. Staying in that state of alert, that high state of stress means wear and tear on the body, stress hormones like cortisol and norepinephrine 
can contribute to sleeplessness, weight gain, and anxiety over extended periods of exposure, according to the Mayo Clinic. The pandemic, Bolt Lundstedt pointed out, is possibly the most stressful experience many people have had in their lifetime. Daily life has been upended. Employment is, unemployment has skyrocketed. And more than 6 million people around the world have been infected. Normally, immense challenges like those would have you seeking the reassurance and support of family and friends. But due to the nature of the virus, people are at least more physically alone than ever, making it that much harder to cope. Now, again, the virtual development. This is why like, we, we brought you that interview talking about, uh, you know, wireless connectivity, right? You know, how much more connectedness, fighting loneliness would we be capable of if we just had the, the data connections that we're technologically capable of today? We'd be able to create, you know, much better remote virtual experiences that actually combat loneliness in a meaningful way. Whereas today, you know, most of us are lucky if we can just do consistent video conferencing. So uh, studying loneliness. Loneliness is something that almost everyone can relate to, but scientists are still working to understand how and why it impacts health. One of the fundamental challenges of the research, loneliness is a subjective feeling that can't really be measured. Not even the size of a person's social network can guarantee how lonely they are. She said it's a matter of asking people how they feel in surveys or indirectly, uh, directly, like how often would you say you're lonely or indirectly do you feel you lack companionship? NASA has been studying the effects of isolation and confinement on astronauts for years, coming to some of the same conclusions as myriad other studies. Isolating conditions can lead to cognitive and behavioral issues. Elsewhere, though, researchers are, researchers are looking at biological aspects of loneliness and how it physically affects the body. That can mean looking at brains. So they said that uh, your risk for Alzheimer's increased 51% for each point on the loneliness scale that they used, rating it between one and five. Autopsies were performed on those who died during the study. Loneliness wasn't shown to cause the hallmark brain changes me, yeah, uh, with Alzheimer's disease, including nerve plaques and tangles, or tissue damage by lack of bl blood flow. However, one researcher involved in the study, Robert S. Wilson, said loneliness could make people more vulnerable to the deleterious effects of age-related neuropathology. As Turin Canley, professor of integrative neurosciences at Stony Brook University said, loneliness can be a good predictor of accelerated cognitive decline. So, the connection with health issues isn't entirely understood, but as a general aggravating factor, if you're lonely, you might be less likely to take care of yourself if you're feeling depressed and down on yourself in general. You might not eat as well, drink too much, worry more, sleep insufficiently, and all of those habits can have serious long-term effects on your health. So, researchers in a study some 30 years ago with a longitudinal study uh, said, so this was 30 years ago, participants agreed not only to annual physical and psychological checkups, but to donate their brains when they died. Researchers looked at two regions of the brain related to cognition and emotion. They found genes associated with cancer, cardiovascular disease, and inflammatory disease expressed in those who were lonelier. And it makes sense, right? This is just, if loneliness is something that depresses your happiness, your serotonin, increases stress hormones, puts you in a fight or flight, uh, you know, reflex uh, of, of stress hormones more often because of bad habits and all the other negativity, of course, this is going to have negative health impacts. The future of loneliness, even as states are starting to relax lockdown orders and restrictions on restaurants, bars, and other public places, the role social distancing could play in society is unknown. In April, Harvard researchers said intermittent social distancing could be necessary through 2022. So don't just think this is going to go away. Astronaut, uh, NASA astronaut Scott Kelly, who did 340 days in space, wrote a piece for the New York Times in March offering advice. Based on his experience, he recommends keeping a journal, sticking to a schedule, and getting a hobby. Nemec from Cigna noted how now more than ever, it's important to check in on others and be open to having honest conversations about feelings of loneliness while batting down stigma attached to the feeling. We need to reach out to some friends and make sure we maintain those connections and have meaningful conversations. He said, it's important for all of us to be comfortable 
asking other people how they feel. So finally, one more big positive thing in our habits, getting away from loneliness in order to achieve happiness. How? Studyfinds.org gives us the answer again. Do good, live longer. Volunteering may add years to lifespan, improves overall well-being. My little feel-good thing, aside from everything I do on my activism, that anybody who's healthy can do is donate blood. I love that. And it's a you go and connect and give a piece of your body to possibly save the life of someone else's. It's an incredibly satisfying thing that I get in that. The things that I do just to help out neighbors and friends and things we're doing here with the Garden of Freedom, building a facility that can help people and be a resource. So here it is. Whether it's planting trees or serving food to the homeless, volunteering your time for the greater good makes a difference in the lives of many. As it turns out, doing good deeds also benefits your body too. A new study out of Harvard shows that people who regularly volunteer enjoy longer, happier, healthier lives. When you give, you also receive. So this is about, I mean, there's so many studies back this up. You can still volunteer safely during a COVID-19 outbreak. The authors say the coronavirus lockdown could be the perfect time to start getting involved with your community. And I, I, I want to use my mother here as one of my most inspiring examples, not just in her attitude and being happy and, and having a positive outlook on life, but also in the way that she engages with her community, even around corona. And her thing was getting masks out. Now, she's been involved in community theater, in uh, the community hospital out there. You know, and I, if I try to say like an exhaustive list of all the things she's done out there on San Juan Island and in the Friday Harbor community, I'd be selling her short on something. But now it's masks. People want masks. They want to be able to protect others from themselves in case they happen to be uh, uh, asymptomatic carriers. And I totally support that. And they're an island community. They're doing a really good job of, of keeping their cases low and sticking together. And so my mom was organizing an effort to uh, to make and distribute masks. And a lot of this is for, for people in businesses and hospitals. Like if you're, if you're working a counter, um, you know, your face, this is really, even for me as a customer, just being a bit of a germaphobe, I don't mind that, you know, at Circle K and so many other retail points, they have the bigger sneeze guard glass now. So I know that if the, the person working the machine, who's probably at a higher exposure level, just because they work retail, maybe they're not as, germophobic as me that I know they're not going to transmit something to me or cough in my face. I'm cool with that. You want to make me wear a mask to come in your store? You know, I might shop somewhere else, but you know, I'd probably just be like, I'll probably, all right, that, that makes you feel safe for me. You think that's appropriate in your store? And I'll comply with that. So my mom is doing this thing for her community kind of in that spirit. And it's, it's a beautiful thing that she's doing, volunteering and connecting with people. So there are plenty of things that you can do right now, which brings us finally to the goal of all of this, Merriam-Webster, happiness defined, a state of well-being and contentment, a pleasurable or satisfying experience. So why would you ever choose anything less than that if that is truly your choice at least most of the time. And as I've said, not being an absolute here, absolutist here, certainly acknowledging some caveats. There are times when, you know, choosing happiness might not be the right thing to do or the most important focus of your life. There are times when you might not be capable of it because your body is working against you. Your own brain chemistry is fighting you. Or there's some immediate trauma that you are experiencing that is overwhelming your emotional reaction. But in terms of your outlook, your attitude, well, let's just go back to the text for more, shall we? Do we need freedom to be happy? Most certainly not. Happiness is not pursued, captured, beaten over the head with a club and hauled home to be enjoyed forever and ever. It is often pointed out that money can't buy happiness. Money can buy happiness, only to the point to which money can no longer buy independence, but even that independence is based on an illusion of external conditions. The most successful people by any measure 
are as prone to misery and depression as anyone. Looking at the modern world and antidepressant consumption, we might conclude that wealth causes depression. Even a brief examination of the human condition reveals that happiness is not a pursuit as much as a choice. True mental freedom is empowerment to choose your state of mind. If the only happiness you ever know is dependent on external factors, you will remain a slave to circumstance and never be truly happy. You can only swing between happiness and fear, knowing deep down that if conditions beyond your control change, you won't be happy. What a sad state of emotional servitude and vulnerability. A crude animal in such a primitive state is dangerously prone to manipulation, while you will never control the challenges that life presents you. And you may never master your animalistic reactions, your mood and your frame of mind are your choice. This is the unique gift of human consciousness. This is the great beauty of human nature. This is the foundation of our capacity for love and connectedness and thus freedom. Being happy is as simple as changing your mind. Of course, this speaks to a range of mental states we can choose. With true mental freedom, we can choose to be determined, thoughtful, compassionate, patient, loving. But beneath all that, why would we ever choose to be any less than perfectly happy while it really is that simple? And it really is that easy. It is a discipline of happiness. Emotions serve an essential role for survival. Fear and the fight or flight response have saved countless lives. But such hardwired responses often take over our evolved brains and keep us from fully using them. Rational fears become anxiety and insecurity. Disappointment becomes depression. Hostility becomes anger and hatred. The discipline of happiness is separating these reactions from how we deliberately choose to live our lives. It is the practice of living well. This empowerment liberates us as individuals and as a species from all past misdeeds of our primitive nature. Living well is not just the best revenge, it is the only revenge worth having. Happiness is the ultimate measure of success. But if you choose to dwell in fear, disappointment, and hostility, and choose to be unhappy, then you'll be unhappy. We are programmed to fear death, but wouldn't you rather face it rationally, calmly, happily? Fear not only makes us vulnerable to manipulation by those who would oppress, it, oppress us, it also tempts us to become oppressors. The tyranny of democracy encourages the broadest participation in fear-based oppression. Every politician's pitch is based on some version of, if you give me power over you, I can make you happy and take away fear. In the act of voting, we are not choosing leaders for ourselves. We are trying to impose our choice of leaders and fears on others. Instead, we should seek to be the alphas of our own lives. Someone who is truly emotionally free has no need for imposed external authority. The people who are the driving force behind statism are not happy, and truly happy people are not very political. The freedom movement is not a political movement. It is an anti-political movement. A truly happy person can appeal to the better nature of fellow human beings, can meet them with peace and persuasion and displace coercion with voluntary relationships and self-government based on self-ownership. A person who knows their capacity as a free, beautiful, independent person will never say, but what will people think of me? A person who can be happy in any situation will never say, but what if I lose my job? A person who knows self-discipline will never say, but what if the sacrifice is too great? The compassion of a truly happy person will say, how could I possibly not share my joy? 
and let some poor victimizer continue in the misery of oppressing others. Only a mental slave will hate their oppressors. A free mind will pity them and seek to share joy with those who are deficient in love. We should not fight oppression or struggle for liberation, but rather empower those who have succumbed to mental slavery. The greatest weapon against tyranny is a mind that refuses to submit to manipulation. If we want to be warriors for truth, soldiers for justice, and champions of freedom, we must first attain the discipline of happiness and a great capacity for living in love. Be the master of your own mind. Choose your demeanor at all times. Never meet a fellow person with force or coercion. Strive to live by reason. Smile because you're alive. And remember, happiness is the ultimate act of defiance. So I'll hope, I hope that you will join me in choosing freedom and choosing happiness. And if this little video, this series of ideas has empowered you in any way to be happier, I hope you'll find a way to share these ideas with others.